Hello, everyone, and welcome to Lecture 10 of GPU Computing. Uh, today, we're going to talk about a new parallel pattern, which is reduction. Um, last time, we spoke about stencil computations, uh, and we saw how a stencil computation is a computation where you have a grid, uh, and uh, in this grid, uh, you're trying to compute a value at some point in the grid, and the value at that point in the grid is going to become dependent on the, the point in that grid as well as the neighbors uh, of, of, uh, of that point. Okay, uh, and the typical way that we, uh, this over here was an example of uh, a 2D stencil, uh, and we saw how uh, with, a, uh, with a, a 2D stencil, we store typically our grid points uh, as a 2D array. Uh, so here you can see how for each of these points, uh, output values, uh, the, their result is going to be based on the input values of the corresponding input point uh, and the grid point uh, neighboring it. Okay, we also saw, uh, uh, we also looked at 3D stencil. In fact, we implemented 3D stencil. Uh, so this was our first uh, experience with uh, using three-dimensional grids. Uh, so 3D stencil is the same, uh, except that rather than just having neighbors in the X and Y dimension, you also use the neighbors in the Z dimension. Uh, and we said that a, a, a straightforward way of parallelizing stencil is by simply assigning a thread to every uh, output element. And we can do that by using three-dimensional grids of threads. So we implemented a version of Stencil that did this, uh, but then we observed that, that uh, Stencil actually has quite a bit of data reuse, right? So if I, if I have a thread block that's responsible for these output elements over here, then the thread block collectively uses these input elements, and you'll notice that uh, some of these input elements are used by multiple uh, output elements. So for example, uh, this input element is going to be used uh, for uh, computing this output element and this output element and this output element and then also this output element over here. Uh, and, and because of this data reuse in Stencil, uh, the way we usually dealt with data reuse is through shared memory timing. So we saw how we can load our input tile into shared memory uh, and then use it in order for us to uh, uh, compute uh, the output element. Uh, next, we analyzed the compute to memory ratio and we saw how uh, with tiling, we're able to improve the compute to memory ratio. Well, and we also saw how uh, it, the more we increase the tile size, the better the compute to memory ratio is. Uh, so what we wanted to do is we wanted to go from the small tile size that we were using to a larger tile size. And the intuition was that with a larger tile size, we have a larger amount of input elements relative to the boundary elements. Uh, and the, uh, with stencil, the boundary elements are not really reused, unlike convolution, where you do have some reuse with the boundary elements. So, uh, so uh, the larger tile size allowed us to have fewer boundary elements and more internal elements, hence more data reuse. Now, the problem with increasing the tile size like this, especially that this is a three-dimensional uh, block, is that we quickly exceed the maximum number of threads per block needed to uh, load the input tile and also compute the output tile. And also, the we quickly exceed the amount of shared memory that's, that's uh, available to us to store the entire input tile. Uh, and even if we don't exceed the amount of shared memory, uh, we might end up using too much shared memory, which would hurt our occupancy. So the way we dealt with this is to be able to process an out a larger output tile without increasing the number of threads, what we did is we used thread coarsening. So we said, rather than launching a 3D block uh, to process this entire cube, what we're going to do is we're gonna launch a 2D grid of threads, a 2D block of threads. And what this block is gonna do is that it's going to loop sequentially through uh, the code, uh, sorry, through the, through the, the cube. Uh, and in each of these steps, it only needs three uh, planes from the input tile. So what this does is that it reduces the number of threads that we have through coarsening, but then also we reduce the amount of shared memory that we need because we only need to store three planes at any point in time. Uh, so, and this allows us to be able to process our bigger output blocks so that we have more data reuse, but without exceeding our thread and shared memory limit. Uh, then the final observation we made was that at any uh, point in time, uh, when we are using these three uh, these three planes, the previous plane, the current plane, and the output plane, uh, only the elements in the current plane are actually shared across the threads computing different outputs. But if you look closely, the elements in the next plane and the previous plane are only used by the thread that loads them. Uh, so, for example, uh, the, the, this output element over here, 
which corresponds to this input element over here. This is the only element that's going to use uh, these neighboring elements in the Z dimension. No other output uh, values in this plane will use these neighbors in the Z dimension. So based on this observation, what we said is, rather than storing all three planes in shared memory, what we would do is we load the next plane into a register, and then when it becomes the current plane, we move the register to shared memory, and then when, it be when the, the current plane becomes the previous plane, we move that shared memory back to a register. So kind of to uh, illustrate that uh, better, uh, over here, uh, this element over here is only used uh, to, uh, is only used uh, with this input value. So this element is placed in a register. On the next iteration, uh, it becomes in the current plane. So we move it to shared memory because now it is not just used by this input with this input element. It's also used with this input element and with this input element. Uh, and then on the next iteration, uh, it becomes in the previous plane, and in the previous plane, uh, it's only going to be used with this input element, so we can go and put it back inside of a register. Uh, and we call this register tiling, this uh, this ability to, this idea of uh, storing uh, a tile uh, in registers as opposed to storing it in shared memory, we called it register tiling. And we said that we had actually seen register tiling before because we were applying register tiling to our output tiles with matrix multiplication uh, and with, with convolution all the time. Uh, we just never, it was just not apparent to us, uh, but here with, with uh, stencil, it became more apparent this idea of register tiling because sometimes the same tile was in shared memory and sometimes it was in, in registers. Okay, so this was a quick overview of what we covered last time. Any uh, questions? Is everything clear to everyone? Professor, just about the register tiling, it seems like uh -huh. we have no control uh, on it. Yeah. Uh, what do you mean we have no control on it? Yeah, no, it, if the code will allow you to do, uh, and if the algorithm is, uh, uh, is uh, will use a lot of uh, register tiling, it will use it. But if not, it won't. It's not something that we can initiate or something like that. So, so any optimization you apply is going to depend on the algorithm and whether the algorithm lends itself to that optimization or not. But, but you actually make a good point in the sense that, so here the reason we were able to uh, do register tiling uh, is that uh, the, this next, that the previous uh, and the next elements are not used except by this current element. But if this was a 3D convolution, for example, and we were applying the same technique for a 3D convolution, we actually would not be able to apply register tiling. And the reason is that this, in a, in a 3D convolution, this element, this input element, will actually be used with, uh, with uh, this input element and this input element and this input element. Uh, so this, was, this is one of the distinctions between convolution and, uh, and stencil, uh, is that with, uh, with convolution, we use uh, more, of the bound, more of the surrounding input elements. But with stencil, we use fewer of them, so there's less uh, data reuse. And then there's also more, uh, but there's also this opportunity to apply register type. Uh, so, uh, so thank you for that question. It reminded me to uh, uh, make that point that uh, I, I maybe forgot to stress. Uh, okay, so uh, with that said, uh, today we're going to talk about a new parallel pattern, which is reduction. Uh, so, what do I mean by what is a reduction? A reduction is an operation that reduces a set of input values to one output value. So we have a set of input values and we reduce them to one output value. Uh, and the reduction operation could be a sum, it could be a product, it could be a minimum, it could be a maximum. Uh, in general, the reduction operation is an associative operation and it is a commutative operation and it also has a well-defined identity value. So all, all, all of these, sum, product, min, max, these are all associative and commutative and also they all have well-defined identity value. Uh, so an identity value for some, uh, identity value is uh, basically uh, kind of the initial value of the accumulator, or it's basically the value uh, that you get when there are no elements to reduce. Uh, so in sum, the identity value is zero, and product the identity value is one. At minimum, the identity value is the absolute maximum, and in maximum, the identity value is the absolute. Uh, so what we will do it, in this lecture is we will use sum as an example for reduction. However, uh, everything we're going to talk about it, it applies equally 
to other forms of reduction, such as product, minimum, and maximum. Okay. Uh, by the way, sometimes people also call, call reduction full. Uh, actually, fold is, is a little bit more general than reduction. Uh, but if you're familiar with what folds are, uh, a reduction is basically a fold. Um, okay, so uh, to start with, uh, uh, let's look at how we would implement a sequential reduction. So if I were to implement a sequential reduction, what I would do is I would simply have a loop, right? I would initialize uh, my sum. If I want to do a sequential reduction for sum, I would initialize the sum to zero, and then I loop from i equals zero to n, where n is the number of elements in my input, and I do sum plus equals the input. Okay, so this is how I would do uh, a sequential reduction for sum. Okay, in general, uh, the way that what a reduction looks like is that you have some accumulator, you initialize that accumulator to an identity, and then you loop through the elements uh, of the array, uh, and you apply some operation f, which is my uh, which is my associative and commutative operation to the accumulator uh, and uh, the input in order to get the new value of the accumulator. Okay, uh, so as you can see, uh, reduction is quite sequential, right? We have this loop and we have a loop carried dependence. So it's not like vector addition where all the loop iterations were independent. Here we have a dependence across these loop iterations. Uh, so the question is, how can we parallelize something like this? Any ideas? You can divide it and have several threads compute several parts of it and then add them up for say, instance for the sum right so we can divide it up have each thread maybe sum up a part but then at some point each thread is going to have one part uh one partial sum and we need to combine them together right so how can we combine them assuming each thread maybe takes one element right somebody somebody saying trees exactly so we can have uh we can have some kind of tree structure so a parallel reduction uh, can uh, can be done as follows. If I have an array uh, with these uh, eight elements, okay, what I can do is I can say that every thread is going to add two elements at each step. So here, if I have eight elements, I'm going to create four threads, uh, and these four threads, each of these four threads is going to add two elements in parallel. And now what I've done is I've reduced the number of elements that I need to sum uh, in, by, in half. Okay, so now I have four elements. So with four elements, now I can launch I can launch two threads, or I can use two threads in order to add these four elements in parallel. And now I have two partial sums. And then finally, I can use one thread to add these two elements uh, in parallel in order for me to get uh, the final result. Okay. So this we call this a reduction tree. So we call it the reduction tree. It's a bit it's like sorting, right? Sorry? It's a bit like uh, the, uh, the when you sort, uh, I forgot the name of the sorting method. Is it oh, I think you're thinking of binary search trees. Well, I mean, it, 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 is, a, it is a binary tree, uh, right? But we're not using this. We're not, uh, uh, we're not uh, you know, building a, a binary search tree here. We're just uh, using a tree structure to, uh, uh, this is a kind of a logical tree structure. We're not actually building uh, a tree uh, data structure in memory. Uh, it's the, this tree is more of the com the computation pattern. Pattern of the computation uh, resembles a tree. Uh, okay, so uh, so you'll notice that every uh, thread uh, adds uh, two elements at each step. Uh, so if I have uh, if I have n elements, how many steps would I need to reduce them in parallel in this way? And logarithm, we use uh, log. Right, it's going to be logarithmic, exactly, because uh, I start with n elements, and then I have n over 2 partial sums, and then I have n over 4 partial sums, and then I have n over 8, and then I, I keep going until I'm, I'm done. So I divide by 2 every time. So if I have n elements, uh, it's going to take log n steps, uh, and every step, half the threads are going to drop out. So if I have n elements, the first step, I'm going to have n over 2 threads. The next step, I'm going to have n over 4 threads. The next step, I'm going to have n over 8 threads, etc. Okay, so half the threads are going to drop out every step. And again, this pattern is called a reduction tree. Uh, now, one thing you might notice is that when we reduce elements in this way, okay, over here, uh, when these two threads 
when the, when this thread does a reduction to get this element, and this thread does a reduction to get these to get this element, right? I cannot start this reduction before making sure that these two uh, addition. I cannot start the, the thread that's going to do this addition. Cannot start until it makes sure that these two additions are done. Okay, and what that means is I need to be able to synchronize across threads. Okay, so before we use synchronization in order for uh, for threads that were loading stuff from shared memory to wait for each other uh, to for everybody to load before they start using the data. So here we're using it. We're seeing a different uh, uh, use of uh, shared memory where you have uh, threads. Uh, where here a thread is kind of dependent on uh, two values, uh, so they need to wait for each other uh, to make sure these values are available. It's it's kind of similar to. Uh, shared memory, but kind of a slightly different uh, context. Uh, so here, um, uh, here uh, the way we typically do something like this is we will have these all these threads in parallel do these reductions, and then we will do a synchronization across them, uh, and then we will have these threads do an, uh, uh, the threads for these two elements do a reduction, and then we do a synchronization across them. And then we have, you know, next step threads do a reduction, then we do synchronization. So there's a synchronization every step. Okay. And uh, now what do we know about synchronization on the GPU? What threads can synchronize with each other and what threads cannot synchronize with each other? Threads in the same block can synchronize. Right, exactly. So threads in the same block can synchronize, but threads in different blocks cannot synchronize. So I, I so I'm able to do this uh, if I'm doing the reduction within a single block. But doing a reduction tree across multiple blocks uh, is 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 uh, is kind of uh, a little bit more tricky. So the way we usually do a reduction on the GPU is we do something called a segmented reduction. So it, so because threads must synchronize between steps, and we cannot synchronize threads across blocks, what we will do is we will have a segmented reduction where every thread is going to reduce a segment of the input to produce a partial sum. Uh, and then later on, we we're, we're going to reduce uh, the partial sums uh, together. Okay. Uh, so uh, in other words, if I have my input, uh, what I do is I break up my input into segments. Uh, every thread block is going to do a reduction tree on that segment uh, bec because this reduction tree requires synchronization. And then when the thread block is done, each thread block will have a partial sum. The thread blocks will store their partial sums into some array. And then uh, I will reduce uh, the partials. I will then uh, apply reduction to the partial sum. Okay. Now there are different ways I can apply reduction to the partial sums. Usually, this partial this partial sum array is much smaller than my big input array. Okay. There's multiple ways I can reduce this partial sum. I can actually I can launch a new reduction kernel. Okay. So I can I, I can launch a new reduction kernel that takes this partial sum array and applies all of this to it. And I keep doing that until my partial sum array is one thread block, in which case I have one final partial sum, which is my total sum. Uh, another way to do it is to use something called atomic operations to accumulate these partial sums into one accumulator atomically. And we will look at atomic operations later on. Uh, and then one uh, a third way to do it is to simply add them on the CPU, right? These partial sums are small enough. Uh, so, you know, maybe it's not worth paralyzing the addition of the partial sums. Maybe we can just add them on the CPU, and these are three uh, valid ways uh, of uh, of doing this. Okay. So having said this, uh, now uh, let's. What we will focus on today is this reduction tree. We will focus on how to perform a reduction tree within a single thread block, and then the rest of this other stuff is stuff that we take care of on the host. Okay. So. Uh, reduction tree per block. How can we implement a reduction tree uh, in a, inside of a single thread block? Uh, well, if I have uh, this is my segment that the block is responsible for. Okay. Uh, what I, one way I can do it is I can assign a thread for every other element in this input, and then each of these threads is going to add its value to the value that's next to it. So that's the first step. And now my values are reduced in half. Okay. Uh, now in the next step, uh, th what I need to do is I need to add this element and this element together, and I need to add this element and this element together. 
and I need to add this element and this element together, and this element and this element together. So I only need one thread to add this element and this element together. So this thread over here is no longer needed. So it's going to drop out. Okay. So I'm going to use this thread to add these two elements together, and I'm going to this thread is just not going to do anything. And then I'll use this thread to add these two elements together, and then this thread is not going to do anything. Okay, etc. So this is what I would do in the next step. And now uh, I'll see that I only I need to add these two elements together. I need to add these two elements together. So in this step, I'm just going to use this thread to add these two elements together. And uh, these three remaining threads are not going to do anything. And I'll use this thread to add these two elements together. And these three remaining threads are not going to do anything. So I keep doing this. And then in the final final step, I have two more values to add. So only one thread adds these together, and the remaining threads don't do anything. Okay. So this is how this is one way to implement the reduction tree on the GPU. And let's go and implement this. Okay. Now, obviously, when these threads are adding, right, this thread cannot proceed to add these two elements together and produce this element until uh, this thread is done uh, adding these two elements to pro provide this element uh, for this thread to use. So what we will do is we will have the threads do a, do a, do a add two elements, and then we will do a sync threads. And then we're going to add two elements, then we do a sync threads, then we add two elements, then we do a sync threads, etc. Okay, so let's now go and, and implement this in code. Yes, uh, uh, over here uh, is does someone have a question? Uh, yes, uh, towards the end of the tree, aren't our thread utilization so low that uh, you shouldn't? You're wasting a lot of resources. Uh, yes, so uh, you're you're absolutely right. When we when when the, these threads are not doing anything and only some of the threads are adding, uh, we're wasting compute resources. And we will take a look later on at some things we can do to uh, further optimize this. Okay, but for now, let's go with this uh, this most intuitive approach, uh, despite the uh, the inefficiencies that uh, it has. Uh, okay, so let's uh, go and, and implement this. Uh, so here. I have uh, this reduction, this, re this sub function on the GPU uh, that uh, calls this uh, the the uh, sorry uh, this function on the CPU that calls this GPU kernel that we need, we're going about to implement. Uh, just a quick look. This function is allocating the. I have an input and size n. Uh, I allocate this input uh, on the GPU uh, and then I copy it to the GPU uh, and then I also allocate a partial sums array uh, uh, on the GPU in order for me to restore the partial sums. And then I'm calling the reduction kernel. And then after I call the reduction kernel, I need to I copy back the partial sums. Uh, and then when I copy back the partial sums, uh, I'm I'm here reducing the partial sums on the CPU for simplicity. And then I free the partial sums uh, and the in, I free the partial sums arrays uh, and the input array. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, kind of what the host code is doing. Uh, now what we want to do is we want to write this kernel that does the reduction within a single block. Okay. Now, the first step is for each thread block to identify the segment that it is responsible for. Now, one thing you notice here is that uh, the number of elements that a thread block is responsible for is actually twice the number of threads. Okay, the number of elements it's responsible for is twice the number of threads because in the first iteration, every thread is going to add two elements. Okay, so I want I don't want to launch a thread for every element the block is responsible for because then half of them will not do anything from the very beginning. Okay, so for me to find the segment that the thread block is responsible for, I need to skip over. Uh, I need to skip over two times the number of threads for each thread block. Okay, here I'm going to write unsigned end segment. Segment here is going to be the first uh, the, the the index of the first element that the thread block is responsible for, and it's going to be a block index dot x. It's going to be block index.x times the number of elements that a thread block is responsible for. And that number is going to be block dim.x times two. Right? It's going to be block dim.x times two because every thread block is responsible for twice as many elements as it has threads. Uh, next, what I want to do is, is I want each of these threads to determine what element it's responsible for inside of this segment. Okay? Uh, so here, thread zero is going to be responsible for element zero. Thread one is going to be responsible for element two. Thread two for element four. Thread three for element six. Thread four for element eight, etc. So in general, 
uh, the thread that has index thread index dot X is going to be responsible for the element two times thread index dot X within the block. So here, the absolute index, I'm fine, and I, I is going to be the index of the element that the thread is responsible for in the global array. That's going to be the beginning of a segment plus thread index dot X times two. Okay, because uh, the threads are distributed to every other element. Okay. Now that each thread knows what element it's responsible for in the input, what we would like to do is we would like to have a loop that iterates over uh, these steps in order for me to uh, do my uh, to do my uh, my reduction tree. Okay. Now, what can I use as a loop counter here? What's a convenient loop counter to use? We we can use the thread ID uh, modulo two to the i with i increasing. R right, so we can use the thread ID modulo something to decide what threads we're going to uh, uh, we're going to uh, eliminate each loop iteration. But what is going to be what? How many loop iterations do I need? We're going to need the log two of n. Right, we're going to need log two of uh, of uh, the size of this input, right? Uh, so uh, one one convenient uh, loop uh, variable to use is actually the stride in which we add. You notice over here uh, in the first step, what what uh, distinguishes this step is that every thread adds the element that is plus one to the right. Uh, in this step, every thread adds the element that's plus two to the right. In this step, every th uh, thread adds el the element that's plus four to the right. And in this step, every thread adds the element that's plus eight to the right, and 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 so on. Okay. So actually, uh, the uh, the uh, convenient block index to use, uh, loop uh, index to use is the stride. The stride starts at one, and then it doubles every iteration until it reaches the block dimension. So here, in the last iteration, the stride is eight, which is the number of threads that I have, because it's half. This eight over here is half the size of the total array. Which is basically the number of threads that we have, the block dimension. Okay, so my loop uh, that's going to loop over these steps is going to. I'm going to use the stride as the uh, as the loop index, and the stride is going to start at one. So here, uh, the offset is one. So I'm going to start at one, uh, and the stride is going to keep going until it reaches block dim. Okay, so here I'm going to have stride is less than or equal to block dim. Okay, and what do I do with the stride every iteration? Here it's one, here it's two, here it's four, here it's eight. So what do I do with it every iteration? I multiply it by two. Okay. So this is going to be my loop. Okay. So now that I have uh, this stride, okay, what do I need to do each iteration? Well, every every thread is going to add the element uh, add to its element, the element that it owns, the element that is stride to the right of it. Okay, so in this in the first iteration, every thread adds its element to the element that is one to the right. Uh, every in the second iteration, every thread adds the element to the element that's two to the right. So in general, every iteration, I'm going to do input of i plus equals input of i plus stride. Okay. So every iteration, every thread will add its element to the element that is stride to the right. Okay. However, we need to be careful here. Not every thread is going to do this addition every every on every iteration. And the first, when the stride is one, every thread is going to do it. When the stride is two, every other thread is going to do it. So thread zero will do it. Thread two will do it. Thread four will do it. Thread six will do it. Right. When the stride is four. Every fourth thread is going to do it. The thread zero will do it, and, th and thread four will do it. The others won't. Okay. When the thread is eight, only thread zero will do it. Okay. So in general, how do how do I based on the stride? How would I identify which thread is supposed to compute? Those that have congruence zero modulo two to the two to the right. To exactly. The so in, in simple terms, those are the that that are a multiple of the stride. And that when the stride is one, all threads are multiple. All thread indices are multiple of one, so they all compute. When the th stride is two, only threads zero, two, four, and six are going to be computing. So only the threads that are multiple of two. When it's four, only threads that are multiple of four. In general, 
the threads that are the thread of this, the threads whose indices are multiple of a stride are the ones that will compute. So I need to have a guard that says if thread index dot x modulo stride is equal to zero, then I will do this. Okay. Okay. So now that every iteration, uh, my I will add on the element that's stride to my right. Okay. So what am I still missing in this loop? After I do this addition, I make sure that only the thread that's supposed to add is doing uh, is doing the addition, and then I do the actual addition. Do I need to do anything else in this loop? We need to store it in shared memory for next time for next iteration. We don't have to, right? We could, but right now we're not doing that. Right now we're just using global memory. Okay, oh, okay. but that's a good optimization. So hold on to that thought, and maybe we'll apply the optimization later on. Okay, but we'll see, we're doing things one step at a time. Aren't you destroying the array, the input array that way by doing it that uh, way? Yes, I'm modifying the input array here, but that's okay. That's okay. I don't mind modifying the input. But there's one thing I need to remember. What do I do after all these threads do the first addition? Can, once the thread is yes. done, can it simply proceed to the next addition? We need to sync. Need to sync. Right. Right, exactly. We need to wait for all the threads to finish before proceeding to the next iteration. And how do we do that? Sync threads. Right. Sync threads. Okay, so now that we do this, now we do sync threads. Now each thread block is going to do uh, a complete reduction tree. And at the end of uh, of this uh, at the end of this uh, stage, every thread block will have a partial sum uh, at the position of uh, thread zero in the block. Okay, every thread will have a partial sum at the position of thread zero in the block. So now what we can do is we can have thread zero and only thread zero store its result uh, in the partial sum array. So here I'm going to write if thread index of x is equal to zero, then I'm going to store the, the partial sum of the block. Okay, I'm going to store input of up to the partial sum of the block, excuse my uh, my typos. Uh, and here the partial sums array is going to have one element for every thread block. So what do I use to index the partial sum array? If thread block zero stores the partial sums of zero. And thread block uh, segment. Sorry. Block ID. Block ID. Right, exactly. Block index dot x. So I'm going to use block index dot x because thread zero, so block zero, source the partial sums of zero, block one, source the partial sums of one, etc. Okay, so this is our reduction code. Any questions? Uh, professor, maybe it should, in the condition of the for loop, maybe it should be stride less than block dim and not less than or equal? Uh, that is not the case. And the reason is, again, uh, that the input, the array, uh, then the segment that the block is processing is going to be twice the block dim. Okay, so here in this case, my input array is 16. So my block then is going to be 8. And here, my, in my last iteration, the stride is going to be 8. Oh, I see. Okay, okay. Thank you. Okay, so that is why, so here block then is not the, the, uh, the size of the array that we're reducing. It's the size of the block. For the size of the array, then, then, then yes, we would have less than uh, the size of the array. It would be two times block. Uh, okay, uh, so let's uh, run this code. Let's compile. And let's run and see the performance that we get. Okay, so on the CPU, it took 21 milliseconds. Uh, on the GPU, it took 3.8 milliseconds. Uh, but if you include all the copy time, uh, it's actually almost the same um, between the CPU and the GPU. Okay. This is a sequential operation. It's not embarrassingly parallel like matrix multiplication and convolution and stencil. So we're not we don't expect to get as much performance improvement for reduction uh, compared to CPU uh, because of the sequential nature of reduction. Uh, however, we still get a fair amount of the performance improvement. So if your data was already on the GPU, then it's actually quite worth it to uh, to do your reduction on the GPU. Okay, so this is our basic code.
Uh, and now what we and this is the code that we wrote together. Uh, but now what we would like to do is we would like to optimize it. Okay. Let's uh, let's talk about what is uh, what is not optimal about uh, this code that we just wrote, and how can we optimize it further? Lots of memory accesses every time. So lots of memory accesses, sure. Yes. So we're 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 repeatedly accessing memory. Okay. What else is not optimal? Uh, the number of threads that you're using in a block are like decreasing. Uh, by two, right? So, so the, the, the threads are dropping out, right? The threads keep dropping out. Okay. Now, if the threads are dropping out, but I have enough uh, enough other threads to do other stuff, that's fine. I can I can I can just fill those cycles with something else. But there's something else that's problematic about these threads dropping out. What is it? Preserving the execution units for the warps for the full warp, as we're not we're using like. Uh... Uh, less threads than the full warp uh, that exactly. can handle it. Exactly. So if you remember, we said that these threads are bound together by SIMD, which means if a thread is not executing a particular branch uh, of control control branch, but another thread in the same warp is executing it, uh, that thread is kind of uh, bound to the to to the thread that's executing. So here, uh, when this and in the second iteration, uh, when this thread is not computing. Okay, but it's bound to this other thread that is computing because of SIMD. Okay, because they have their the warp executes a, a, a following the SIMD model. So because of that, this thread is just going to be idle. It's going to consume execution resources, right? Uh, but it's not going to be doing anything. Okay, so I have control divergence. So that's another pro that's another problem. So so control divergence is a problem here, uh, and there's even there's uh, there's also another problem. What is it? What can I say about the memory access pattern here? You guys remember how we spoke about memory coalescing? We said that we want threads in the same warp to access data from global memory that is that is that is uh, kind of adjacent to each other. In order for us to be able to coalesce those memory accesses, right? Yes, so and they are getting yeah, they are getting far far away from each other, so they are not right, exactly. uh... right. So my threads are not my memory accesses are not coalesced. If you take a look, uh, these threads are going to access every other element together. Okay. And then they're, they're going to come back and access the element to the right together. Okay. So my my accesses are not coalesced, and it gets worse and worse as I go down the street. Okay. But we can we can solve that easily, right? So how can we solve that? Yes, just, we are going to solve that. So how how do you propose to solve that? We just put instead of doing of saving it in. Two two steps or two, uh, four steps uh, ahead, we save it next to each other. Uh, uh, so what you're saying is you want uh, you want this thread, for example, when it does this addition, to store the result here. Yeah. Okay. So we're uh, we're gonna do something along the lines of that, uh, but we're we're also we're we're gonna we're also gonna fix the divergence. Okay. So let's uh, let's see the problem with uh, with uh, well, well actually what you said is along the lines of what we're going to do. So let me let me uh, go ahead and see that. show you how we can further optimize. Uh, okay, so we said the problems are that accesses to input are not coalesced. So the access is input, the access is not coalesced. Okay, uh, and then and you can easily observe that by the way. Whenever you want to know if an access is coalesced, see if the access varies according to the thread index dot. In our case over here, uh, stride is the same for all the threads, but I uh, is actually uh, thread index that is multiplied by two. Okay, so this automatically shows you that the index uh, that that this um, array access is not full. Okay, uh, so the the control divergence problem is as follows. Uh, at the, in the first iteration, uh, I if this was my thread block, right? My thread block is divided into warps. Okay, 
And in my first iteration, all these threads are active. In the next iteration, half of them drop out. Okay, so I have all these threads that are inactive. So now the utilization of my warps is 50%. Okay, in the following iteration, uh, they drop out, more of them drop out. So now the utilization of these warps is 25%. And then the next iteration, uh, the you know these these warps drop out. So now you know uh, warp one and warp three are no longer have any threat computing. So warp one and warp three are gone. So now I don't have to worry about divergence for warp one and warp three. They just won't be scheduled. But I still have divergence in warps zero and warps two. Uh, and then in the last step, uh, uh, warp two drops out, uh, and I have divergence in warp zero. So what can I do to minimize? This control divergence. Well, what we can do is the following. Uh, we can, rather than assigning threads to every other element of the array, we can assign the eight threads in this block to the first, the, the initial elements in the array. And then in the first iteration, they will all get the add these eight elements to these eight elements and store the result here. Okay. So now when these block, when these uh, threads access the left element, the axis is coalesced because all of these are next to each other. And when they access the right element, the axis is also coalesced because the elements are next to each other. In the next step, uh, these, the, the, the top half of the threads drop out, the bottom half of the threads remain active, uh, and they, they do the addition this way. And in the next step, we do this, and in the next step, we do this. Okay. So this solves both the coalescing and the divergence problem at the same time. And the reason is that now, whenever the threads are accessing data at the same time, that data is nearby. And then also, rather than the threads in the middle dropping out, uh, the threads only at the end are dropping out, right? So if these first four threads were a warp, warps are actually 32, but here for illustration, we're, we're showing them as smaller. If these first four threads were a warp and these remaining four threads were a warp, then after the first iteration, these four threads will all drop out together. So, so either, the, but, and then these four threads will compute. So either the whole warp is computing or the whole warp has dropped out. There's no control divergence. Okay, so let's go and implement uh, this approach over here. So when I come to this code, I'm gonna go back to my uh, uh, reduction code. And now I'm gonna modify this code uh, to implement this tree over here. The segment is getting the same. Okay, every thread block is still taking uh, two times uh, the number of threads in the, in the block. However, this time, rather than that, rather than the thread owning the element that is segment plus two times thread index away from it, here each thread is going to own the element that is here. Thread thread zero is going to own the element zero. Thread one is going to own the element one. Thread two is going to own the element two, etc. So rather than doing two. Uh, thread uh, segment plus thread index times two. We're just going to do segment plus thread index. Better. Okay. Uh, now for my loop, if you notice here, how is my stride uh, changing? So this time my stride starts at block dim dot x. So here my stride starts at eight, and then it becomes four in the next iteration, two in the next iteration, one in the next iteration. So now my loop bound is not going to go from one to block dim in multiples of two or in powers of two. It's going to go from block dim down to one. Okay, so I'm going to write if stride is equal to block dim uh, and then stride is greater than or equal to one. Okay, I can also write just greater than zero. And then I do stride divided by two. Okay, and the next next what I need to do is I need to make sure that only the threads that are supposed to compute are actually active. So in the first, in the in, in previously uh, every other you know all the multi threads that are multiples of stride were the ones that computed. So first all threads computed, then all the multiples of two computed, then all the multiples of four computed, etc. This time let's see which threads are supposed to compute. In the first iteration everybody computes. So when the stride is eight, everybody computes. When the stride is four, only the first four threads compute. When the stride is two, only the first two threads compute. And when the stride of one, only the first thread computes. So what should be our condition in this case to make sure that to, 
to only make sure the threads that are supposed to compute do the computation. Thread ID below stride. Right, exactly. I just have to do uh, thread index dot x is less than stride. Okay. And then I do input of i plus equals input of i plus stride. That's not going to change. I do sync threads. That's not going to change. And then finally, the thread zero stores its value to the partial sum. That's not going to change. Okay. Clear to everyone how we how we reformulated reformulated the tree to eliminate the control divergence and the uh, and have better coalescing. Let's see how well this code performs. I'm going to compile it. Remember, previously uh, we had 3.79 milliseconds. Uh, so now, if we run our reduction, uh, we have 2.75 milliseconds. So we see there's a kind of a significant improvement from eliminating control divergence and also enabling memory coalescing. Okay. Any questions? Yes, doctor. Uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, I wanted to ask. It's a detail. I'm not related to to this exactly, but. Uh, when you when we do operations, things like you know integer integer operations like uh, multiplication, division, and uh, addition, and, or even you know and simpler simpler operations like addition and shifting, uh, do they, do they, does the GPU use the same ALUs or the uh, or uh, different ALUs? So we have integer ALUs and we have floating point ALUs. Just like in in your CPU, you have your integer ALU and you have your floating point coprocessor with its own ALU. So you only have one type of each, not like simpler ALUs for simpler operations like addition and uh, and shifting and and another type for uh, multiplication division. I mean that that just has to do with where you draw the box around the ALU in your hardware, right? Yeah. Okay. You can think of your your adder and your multiplier as being two different blocks, or you can think of them as being the same block. That's just a, that's just a logical difference. That's not really a, a physical difference. Okay. Okay. Professor, is it possible to bring in uh, other blocks at different times to uh, to fill in the, the unused threads? So you want to? Are you you're asking if we can bring in other blocks to fill in unused threads? I don't think I uh, I uh, I don't think I understood what you what the question is. Well, uh, there are still a lot of unused threads. Uh, in uh, in uh, one, for example, uh -huh. iteration. So so instead, of, for example, in the first iteration, we can actually maybe uh, do uh, maybe on different threads execute uh, two different blocks or it's. Ah, okay. I see what you mean. Yes, that, that's actually a good idea. So what you're saying is, you want because we're paying this price of synchronization and divergence as we come down here, uh, we can have each thread. Uh, add multiple elements first before uh, doing this divergent tree, right? Is that what you're saying? I'm I'm not I'm not I'm not sure uh, about uh, what you said. Basically, you know, for example, here we have uh, one, two, three, four. We have a couple of threads. For example, something over two. Uh, so the next step would be to bring in another block and also execute this thing over two. Then we can. We, we can start adding uh, adding it into maybe a shared memory or something to to fill in the the, the the threads you see what I mean okay so we will use shared memory you mentioned shared memory we'll use shared memory uh, I think what you're saying is you want to try and reuse so here when you're in this step uh, you want to try and reuse these threads to do something else um, the answer is that you know if you try to do these kinds of gymnastics uh, the, the whole reduction tree is getting smaller and smaller, right? So, so ultimately, you will reach a point where there is not enough work to go around to fully utilize all your threads. So this, this bottom part of the tree is inevitable. Uh, what you could do, however, is you could try to have the threads do more work initially by processing a larger segment uh, where, the, where the initial steps are not, don't have divergence before you reach uh, this, this uh, phase over here where the divergence is suitable. Uh, and and we will will actually do this uh, shortly. Okay, so hold on to that question. I think uh, I think we'll see that we will try to do something along the lines of what I think you're such. Professor, yes. Just in in this example for the first uh, step, 
wouldn't it have been better from a memory coalescing perspective to have each thread process um, say one element and the element right next to it, kind of like what we did last time, instead of having them, um, uh, like uh, instead of having each element process one element at one position and the other at say 1024 elements away? So uh, a good question, I'm glad you asked that. So remember, coalescing happens. Okay, let me move on to the code. So this is the code we have written. So uh, the accesses that get coalesced are the accesses that are issued by the same warp and by threads in the same warp in the same instruction. Okay, so what that means is that uh, the load instruction to load input of I is, a di is different from the load instruction to load input of I plus stride. Okay, so here on the diagram, the accesses that are being issued but the load instructions that are being issued by the same threads in the same instruction are when these all threads access the left value, which is these elements here. And then the, 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 uh, the, uh, when these, uh, sorry, eight threads access the right values, which are these elements over here. Okay. However, when this thread accesses this value and then accesses this value, right? These two values are being loaded at different points in time. But that but that's not this that's not the scope where coalescing happens. Coalescing happens across threads in the same warp that access data at the same time, not within a thread that accesses data at different points in time. Is that clear? Yeah, it's very clear. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, okay, so uh, so this is the code that we wrote, and just kind of a, 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 a look at what the divergence looked like. So what we did is we started off with all of these threads being active in the first iteration. In the second iteration, the top half of my threads drop out. So now here, warps two and warps three are dropped out, and warps zero and warps one are fully utilized. So I have no control divergence in my second iteration now. In my third iteration, the top half of the threads drop out. So here, warp one drops out and warp zero is fully utilized. So again, I have no control divergence in this step. And then in the final steps, uh, half the threads are going to drop out and the half threads are going to drop out. So here in the final steps, I'm going to have control divergence, but only one of these warps is going to be divergent. And this 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 divergence in the final step is inevitable. Okay, you're you're going to have to pay it eventually. Uh, but you'll notice that it's significantly less than the divergence we had in the previous figure, where every one of these steps had control divergence in multiple warps. Okay, uh, so having said that, uh, I, I hope uh, this reduction uh, exercise gave you a flavor of how we typically optimize uh, uncoalesced accesses and divergent code. Usually it involves having to either rearrange the data that we're accessing or rearrange the threads that we're using in order for us to make sure that the threads are uh, are not divergent and that the way they access memory is coalesced. And we will actually see an example in the future. Uh, in this case, we rearranged how the threads are accessing the data. And later on, we will see another computation pattern where we will actually rearrange the data itself in order for the threads to access it in a coalesced and non-divergent way. Okay, we will look at this when we look at sparse matrix vector multiplication. Uh, so for now, uh, we've, uh, uh, we, we've kind of, we've seen, uh, these these optimizations of eliminate divergence and memory coalescing. Let's now go back to the optimizations that we're uh, we're we're we've practiced quite a bit and we're we're comfortable with. So a lot of you said shared memory, okay, and that's right. We can use shared memory here to optimize something. But optimize what? So we don't really have data reuse here, okay, because no specific value is actually reused. However, the memory locations in which which contain these values uh, are actually reused, okay. So one of the optimizations is that we can load to shared memory, the input to shared memory first, and then we can perform the reduction tree on shared memory. And what this does is that it's avoid, uh, this, uh, this avoids uh, modifying the input. So somebody commented, aren't we modifying the input? Yes, we are. And if we use shared memory, then we, we wouldn't be modifying the input. So let me show you an illustration of what I mean by this. Uh, so here we have our threads uh, loading this data, the, the, uh, summing of this data. What we can do in the first step is when these threads 
add uh, the first two elements, rather than putting the result in the global array, they can put the result in a shared memory array. So basically, I don't need to load the entire segment into shared memory, right? I can have the threads load their first two elements, add them, and then store them in shared memory. So I actually only need as much shared memory uh, as half of the entire segment. Okay. And then, so the initial load is from global memory. And then from here on, the remaining steps can happen inside of shared memory, right? So next I can, uh, I can access shared memory and then I use shared memory and then I use shared memory. And then when I'm done, the final thread will go from, will take the value in shared memory and put it in global memory. And what this does is it'll reduce the amount of times I'm accessing a global memory each time. Okay. Is this clear to everyone? Doctor, why don't we use registers? Aren't registers faster than shared memory? What is it the same technology? Uh, well, great question. Registers are faster than uh, shared memory. However, the reason we don't use registers is because uh, when this uh, second thread, uh, well, this thread over here, uh, actually, let me not do it this way. This thread over here, right? is going to load this element and it's going to load uh, the element that's stride away from it. It's going to add them and it's going to put them here, right? But on the next iteration, which thread is going to load this element? Is it this thread? No, this thread's not active. The thread that's going to load this element on the next iteration is actually going to be this thread over here. Okay, and that is why uh, that is why this thread has to store its result in shared memory so that after the sync threads, this thread can come and access the value from shared memory in order to use it to perform the addition. But why can't you do the same thing with the register? Well, well, because, because one thread is writing the value, another thread is reading the value. So the registers are private to threads, right? Oh, uh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, my yeah, bad. Registers are private to threads. So if I want to have a value read and written by multiple threads in the same block, I need to put that in shared memory. Okay, so let's uh, let's implement this. Uh, so what I want to do now is I want to allocate this shared memory array, and after I do my initial load, I want to put the results in the shared memory array. So the way I'm going to do that uh, is as follows. I'm going to create a shared uh, memory array. I'm going to call it input underscore s. What's the size of this array going to be? A, a block dim. Right, block dim. I'm going to have as many elements as I have threads. Okay, so the size of the array is going to be block dim. Okay, and in the first step, I'm going to load. Uh, the input that the, the value the thread is responsible for and the value that's tried away. And I'm going to put that in the shared memory array. So I'm going to write input underscore s of thread index dot x is equal to input of i plus input of i plus right. Okay. So now I do the first step. What do I need to do after the first step before I begin the second step? Synchronize. Right. I need to do have a sync. I'm going to do sync threads over here. Okay. So now I have my result in my shared memory array. Now I'm going to continue this reduction tree in shared memory. Okay. But this time I'm not going to, my stride here is going to be now half block them. It's not going to be blocked them. Okay. So here the loop bound is now going to be uh, from block dim over two until until uh, one, okay? Uh, and then here, when I access input, uh, the input, I'm gonna access it from shared memory each time. So rather than having input of i, I'm gonna have input s, underscore s of thread index dot x. And here, rather than having input of i plus stride, I'm gonna have input underscore s of thread index dot x plus stride. And then finally, when thread index, when thread zero comes to store the final result, that final result is going to be in shared memory, so I'm going to write input of s of thread index dot x. Okay? 
clear to everyone? Any questions? All right, well then let's run this code uh, and see how it performs. Tells me stride is a define. Looks like I have a syntax error somewhere. Oh, okay. So here, this was supposed to be. I, I put stride over here. What is the stride value in the first iteration? Block dim. Block dim, exactly. This stride value uh, is supposed to be block dim. Okay. File. Uh, and remember, my, my time before was 2.75 milliseconds, so now I'm going to run it, uh, and it's now it's going to be uh, better. It's going to be 2.15 milliseconds. Okay? All right, so now we've seen how we can use shared memory to capture the data reused, uh, and this over here is the code that we wrote. The final step is thread, uh, the final command we're going to apply is thread coarsening. So remember, uh, thread coarsening. Uh, what we said about thread coarsening is that whenever uh, is that if we, when we give hard the hardware more thread blocks than it has resources for, what the hardware typically does is that it serializes those thread blocks. Now, if there's a price I am paying for the parallelization, then what I would like to do is I can reduce that price that I'm paying for the parallelization by rather than letting the hardware serialize the thread blocks, me serializing the thread blocks in the code. Okay? Or having the thread block do the work for multiple thread blocks. So in this case over here in reduction, what is the price that I'm paying for parallelization? What price do I pay? What's expensive about doing the reduction in parallel? compared to doing it sequentially. At some point, some threads become useless and they uh, freeze. Right, exactly. So one of the prices that I'm paying is control divergence. Okay. What's, what's another price that I'm paying? Probably multiprocessors. Right, so the fact that I'm using multiple threads Right to run to to run simultaneously. What do these threads need to do with each other? Sync. Right, they need to synchronize exactly. So the prices that I'm paying for uh, for parallelization are synchronization and control divergence. Here, my cost of parallelization is synchronization and control divergence. So what I can do is, if my thread blocks are going to get serialized anyways, rather than letting the hardware serialize them, I can serialize serialize uh, the work myself by rather than having every thread block responsible for every thread responsible for one input element, have it or or in our case two input elements, we can have it responsible for multiple input elements. Okay. So it is better to course in the threads if there are many more blocks and resources available. And let me show you an illustration of what I mean by this. Uh, if I have a, a, what I, what I can do is if I want to apply thread coarsening, is I can assign a much bigger input to my to my uh, threads. Then, uh, then the, the number of threads that I have. So previously, I was assigning two times the number of threads to the block. Here, I'm assigning four times the number of threads to the block. Now, what happens in this case is that these these eight threads now they're going to add the elements that are that are uh, stride that are block them away, and then they will add the elements that are two times block them away. Then they will add the elements that are three times block them away. And then they put the result in shared memory. Okay, so now rather than having each thread responsible for adding two initial elements, I have each thread responsible for adding four initial elements. Okay, now if you'll notice this initial phase where these threads are adding uh, these these uh, these subsegments of the segment that was assigned to the thread block, I don't have any control divergence here, right? Because all eight threads are active in each of these additions. Not only do I now have control divergence, I don't need to synchronize. Because over here, the, 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 these threads are adding four elements here. These four elements that the thread, this thread, the four elements that this thread adds are not produced by any other threads. These four elements are, are, are uh, 
you know, uh, be owned uh, or owned by this thread. So this thread goes and adds, adds this element and this element, and then after that by eight, and then after that by eight. Okay. It, these other elements that the thread is fetching here uh, and, and it's fetching here, these are not being produced by other threads. So I actually don't need to synchronize each for each one of these steps. Okay. So by applying coarsening, now I am able, I'm, I'm adding this entire uh, set segment. I'm reducing this entire segment, but with fewer synchronized, uh, fewer uh, relative number of synchronizations and less control diversion. Now, once I've reduced it down to the number of threads, then uh, I will have to ha do uh, the reduction tree and shared memory, which incur has synchronization and control divergence. So the synchronization control divergence is here now, okay, but it's not over here. However, if I had, if, if I had, if I didn't do coarsening, if I had the, the first thread block do 16 elements and the next thread block do 16 elements, then what would have happened if, if those thread blocks got serialized is that the first thread block is going to do a tree, so it's going to have synchronization and divergence. And the next thread block, when it's reducing these, these top 16 elements, it's also going to do a tree with, with synchronization and control divergence. But by, by, by having one thread block be responsible for this segment, I, I only have the synchronization and the control divergence once, uh, and the uh, the 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 addition of the second segment happens uh, without any, or the addition of the second half of the segment happens without any part, any control divergence or uh, uh, or synchronization. Okay, let's implement this uh, to kind of make it clear clear what we're talking about. Uh, so what I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to switch to the code now, uh, and what I'm going to do is need to first uh, define a coarsening factor. Right, so I need to first define a coarsening factor. So I'm going to define my coarsening factor. Okay, uh, let me let me start out with something like four. Okay, now with a coarsening factor of four, what that means is that every thread block is going to have an input segment that is four times the original what it what it originally had. So originally, the thread block, uh, the size of a segment, is block dim times two. Okay, so now the size of a segment is going to be block n times two times the coarsening factor. Okay, so here I'm going to multiply by the coarsening factor. Okay, so now each each thread block goes to the segment that it's responsible for. Uh, every element, uh, this doesn't change, right? Every element is going to primarily be responsible for uh, the segment, the beginning of a segment plus the thread index. Okay. But now, uh, what I before what I was doing is I was loading two elements, adding them, and uh, I was loading two elements, adding them, and putting the result in shared memory. Okay. Now what I want to do is I want to load this many elements and add them and store them in shared memory. Okay. Uh, so here in this illustration, my coarsening factor is two. Uh, so now I want to loop over uh, the elements that. So if I if my coarsening factor is two. Every thread is responsible going to be going to be for four elements. If my coarsening factor is coarse factor, every thread is going to be responsible for two times coarse factor elements. Okay. Uh, so what the thread will do is uh, the thread will first uh, load this tile and then load this tile and then load this tile and then load this tile and add them to shared memory. Uh, so the way I do that is as follows. I'm going to get rid of this. Okay. I'm going to write float. Sum equals zero. Okay, this is going to uh, each thread now is going to add uh, elements that is responsible for in this uh, segment. Uh, I'm going to go for four. Professor, if you I'm have trying. a four, yes. If you have a four loop, uh, don't you still have control divergence? Well, not if they all execute the same number of iterations. Can you repeat that? So not if they all execute the same number of iterations. Oh, okay. Okay. So here, uh, what each before each thread was loading two elements. If I have a if I if I have a coarsening factor of coarse factor, then each thread is going to load two times coarse factor elements. Okay. So I'm going to write four tile equals zero tile less than coarse factor times two. Notice all threads have the same loop bound, so all there will be no divergence. And then I do plus plus tile. Okay, and then I'm going to do sum 
plus equals, and now I'm going to load the input value corresponding to the tile. So in the first for the first tile, thread zero is going to load element zero. For the second tile, thread zero is going to load element eight. For the third tile, thread zero is going to load element uh, uh, sixteen. Then it's going to load element twenty-four, etc. Okay. So in general, the thread is going to load uh, the input uh, at i plus the tile times the coarsening. Uh, sorry, times the block depth. Okay. So first iteration loads the element it has. Next iteration loads the element block dim away. Next iteration loads the element two block dim away. Next iteration loads the element three block dim away, etc. Okay. So here I accumulate these elements into a register. And notice that I don't need to sync here. Okay, because these interpretations don't require synchronization. I'm just storing this partial result in, in the sum register. And then partial result again in the sum register. Now what I'm done with this. Now I need to Take the final result after the discursing step and put it in shared memory. So now I'm going to write input underscore s of thread index dot x is equal to sum. Okay, and then I'm going to continue with this uh, this part of the code where I do the reduction tree in shared. Memory. Okay, any questions about this? Um, professor, yes. Uh, you once mentioned a concept. I think it was called uh, transparent scalability. So uh -huh. when you do, when you apply coarsening, you lose that property, right? Absolutely, yes. So we 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 spoke about that before. When we said we said when we coarsen, we're interfering with the hardware scheduling because we're assuming the hardware is going to serialize. So we're serializing ourselves. If the hardware doesn't serialize, then we lost the transparent scalability, and that's why. The disadvantage of applying coarsening is that we end up having to. Uh, uh, the disadvantage of applying coarsening is that we uh, we uh, we uh, we have to retune this coarsening factor every time. Okay? okay. 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 So the final step now is since uh, each thread block is responsible for more data, uh, we need we're going to need fewer thread blocks. So I have to go down here, uh, and I need to decrement. Uh, sorry, I need to divide the number of blocks. Uh, that I am uh, I am uh, launching. Where is that? Yeah. So here I need to divide. I need to multiply the number of elements per block by the coarsening factor. Okay. Uh, and by doing that, automatically uh, the number of blocks is going to be divided by the coarsening factor. Okay. So I multiply the number of elements per block by the coarsening factor. Uh, can the uh, handle that many, that many threads per block? I'm not increasing the number of threads per block, remember? Uh, oh, elements, okay. I'm yeah, increasing yeah. the number of elements. Each thread is responsible for more elements. And that's why I have to loop over these elements that the thread is responsible for. Okay? So now I'll tell this. And let's run it. And wow. Right. That's pretty that's we got we got some good speed up from this. Okay. And you can try all, all kinds of coarsening factors. Uh let me try a, a larger coarsening factor. Okay. And and you know, dep depending on the hardware, if you if you increase the coarsening factor, you'll get good improvement. And then once you hit a point where you're starting to to serialize too much, then you'll you'll hit a performance degradation. Okay, so here see we get even better performance. Okay. But if I make this something very, very large, like, uh, I don't know. So here, if I make this too large, then, uh, then, you know, I'll probably expect to start seeing a performance to regression. Well, it hasn't regressed yet. So the input that I'm passing is really, really, really big. Okay. But at some point it's going to start performing worse because I'm getting too much serialization and I've interfered with that transparent scalability. Okay. Uh, this is the code that we wrote, uh, and again, the benefits of coarsening is that if all the blocks are executed, uh, so in general, if all the blocks are executed in parallel, we need log n steps, uh, and each step requires a synchronization, so we need log n synchronization. Uh, if the hardware serializes the blocks by a factor of c, then each block is going to have log n steps, log n synchronization, so I'm going to have c times log n steps, and c times log n synchronization, okay? Well, here n is it refers to the number of elements that a block is responsible for. Okay. However, if I if I coarsen 
the block by a factor of C rather than letting the hardware serialize it, uh, then I'm going to have two times C, C minus one initial steps, and then I'm going to have log n steps and log n synchronization. Okay, so by coarsening, I've reduced the number of synch I've reduced the number of synchronization, uh, and I've also reduced the number of steps. Okay. Finally, uh, with boundary conditions, um, uh, when you when you uh, you might when you, when you might end up in a situation where uh, the you know the very last thread block uh, has some elements that are out of bounds. So when you do that, you need to make sure that you handle the boundary conditions properly when you are loading from global memory. And what that means is that uh, over here, when you load from global memory for the first time, you need to make sure that the value that you're loading is within bounds. Otherwise, you can just load zeros. Uh, and then afterwards, uh, if you if you do this, if you handle the boundary condition uh, at the uh, when you're when you're doing this initial step, uh, then you then you don't have to handle it uh, over here. You just put zeros in the irrelevant uh, uh, for the irrelevant values, and then shared memory is uh, is kind of all within bounds, and then everything else is the same. So handling the boundary condition requires you to just be careful over here when you're loading from global memory, and make sure not to load out of bounds. Okay, and with that said, uh, uh, that is all uh, for today, and uh, you can read more about what we uh, uh, what we talked about today uh, in Chapter Five, Section Five Point Three of the text. Uh, somebody was asking a question, and uh, and we were kind of we kept colliding. So, does anybody have any final questions before we end? Yes, I wanted to ask, uh, how can you find the coercing factor without uh, trial and error? Like, uh, what's the hardware resource you should look you should look at? Uh, so, so you can uh, remember how we said in the first lecture or the second lecture that you can query the hardware, or or maybe it was the third lecture. I don't remember which one. Oh, you said we can hmm. we can query the hardware. Yeah, I think it was the third lecture. We said we can query the hardware for its resources. So we can actually no wait, it was the fourth lecture. I'm sorry. Um, so we can query the hardware for the resources that it has. Okay. So what we can do is we can figure out how many SMs we have in the in the GPU, right? We can figure out how many uh, threads, how many threads we can have per SM. We know what our block dimension is. In this case, it's good to have the block dimension be as large as possible. Okay, and then uh, uh, and then uh, uh, what you can do is based on that, you can calculate what is the maximum number of blocks that you can have executing simultaneously. If you're going to be launching many more blocks than that, then you can uh, somehow you know figure out okay what is the what is a good coarsening factor. So if you figure out that you can only uh, execute uh, 160 blocks at a time. So you have 80 SMs, your block is 1,024, you can have 2,048 threads per SM, then your block, you can only have 160 blocks at a time. If your, if your application has 1,024 blocks, okay, but you can only execute 160 at a time, you probably want to coarsen it down to something that's closer to 160, right? Obviously, mm -hmm. you don't want to make it less than 160. Making it exactly 160 is also not a very good idea because it, it takes away the ability of the hardware to to uh, to you know have have some flexible assignment to deal with load imbalance. Okay, mm -hmm. probably want to have it something uh, you know closer, uh, you know, the same order of magnitude of 160, maybe twice uh, that amount or four times that amount, as opposed to 32 times or or a thousand times uh, 160. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, professor. Yes. Is the performance as a as a um, function of the coarsening factor uh, can can you assume it to be convex? So like we tried here with four and one hundred and one thousand twenty four, can we assume it to be somewhere in the middle for the optimal coarsening factor? Yeah. So uh, as you increase the coarsening factor, you'll probably the performance will probably improve, improve, and then at some point it starts uh, getting worse. I see. So it's a fair assumption. It's not like yeah, 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 yeah. You can you can assume that. Yeah. I see. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Well, unless you're in a kind of a, some kind of application where where a coarsening factor of two uh, actually hurts your performance, right? So it depends also on the context. Maybe coarsening, maybe thread coarsening is not a good optimization for your application, or maybe right. maybe it's not a good good optimization for the particular data set that you're using. Okay, so that's uh, so that's a case where you might start uh, degrading performance from the very beginning. Okay. Right. But it's still convex to some extent, right? Because as we increase the coarsening factor, it gets worse and worse. So 
Uh, yes, yes. But uh, what I meant is it won't increase before decreasing and just decrease. But yes, it's not going to be uh, oscillating back and forth. <laughs> I see. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. But, sir, I have a question that's not directly related to what we did today. But so, for example, if I compile uh, some code uh, running on VCC uh, on my machine using a certain GPU, uh, and I just run the executable in another machine uh, that's, that has a different GPU but is still from NVIDIA, is it going to work or not necessarily? So remember in the, in the second lecture, we spoke about how uh, the, uh, the, um, the NVC generates this virtual ISA called CX, and that gets compiled just in, that gets compiled just in time to, uh, to uh, the, the low-level ISA when you, when you execute the code. So yes, you, you could compile on one machine and run on another machine. But there's other aspects of compilation, like making sure that you are you know, you're, you're targeting uh, not just they're both uh, NVIDIA GPUs, but they also both have you know, the same architecture, the same version of the ISA. So if, if all those things hold, then yes, it's possible to compile on one machine and run. Great, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, well, if there are no other questions, uh, then that is all for today, and I'll see you next time. Bye, everyone.